Tenakoto Katoa. This talk is going to introduce ideas associated with degrowth or post-growth perspectives to think about how those ideas can be applied to digital technologies and screen media. To begin with though, I'm going to briefly flag something that I imagine you're all acutely aware of, which is that the current trajectory of global society is leading towards multiple ecological catastrophes. By 2022, we're thought to have crossed five planetary boundaries, so not just climate change, but also reductions in biodiversity, alterations to the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, land use change, chemical pollution, and novel entities, so things like microplastic pollution. These images show some of the news stories from this year that demonstrate that we're already seeing devastating impacts from climate change. In the 30 years since the Rio Earth Summit and the first Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, greenhouse gas emissions have risen by over 60%. So we've known that we need to massively reduce them, but instead they've grown. Without urgent and sustained action that far surpasses current efforts, much of the planet will continue to become a far less hospitable place for human and many kinds of non-human life. Now, in terms of analysing causes and potential ways of addressing ecological crises, I'm going to begin by talking about growth, which begs the question, what do we mean by growth? And I'm going to outline four interconnected ways of thinking and talking about growth. Growth as GDP, as an ideology, as a process that's fundamental to capitalism, and as a material process that requires energy and matter. And I should add that degrowth tends to focus on the last three of these, whereas often critiques of degrowth focus on GDP. First, we have growth in terms of GDP, which is gross domestic product a quantitative indicator of monetary trade that was developed in the United States during the 1930s by Simon Kuznets as a way of trying to grasp the dynamics of the Great Depression. And GDP, or its um, predecessor GNP, only became a dominant way of measuring national economies after World War II. So GDP is actually quite a recent historical invention. GDP has also always been a contentious measure of wealth because it only captures monetary transactions. So most domestic work, most care work, just doesn't count towards it. GDP also doesn't differentiate between positive or negative social or ecological outcomes. So an increase in road traffic accidents or natural disasters that result from climate change can mean that GDP goes up. And this has long led critics, beginning with Kuznets himself, to argue that GDP doesn't really measure what matters in life. Now, a related way of thinking about growth is its ideological dimension, which contends that growth is fundamentally good, that it's natural, that it can continue infinitely, and that growth basically means more prosperity and more happiness for everyone. And the ideology of growth is really important in shoring up support for policies designed to grow GDP, and any attempt to enact degrowth is faced with the challenge of puncturing this hegemonic ideology. And this hegemony is why neoliberal growthist perspectives are typically framed as being non-ideological, neutral, and common sense, despite infinite compound growth of anything uh, that's tangible on a materially finite planet being questionable at best. A third way of conceptualising growth is as a key mechanism underpinning capitalist political economic relations. And this has been the case for centuries before the invention of GDP as a quantitative measure. Capitalism requires the production of surplus value, whose year-on-year -year accumulation implies constant growth. Historically, this took the form of accumulation by dispossession and colonisation. More recently, it's involved varying kinds of commodification and privatisation. And most recently, uh, what's been described as data or techno-colonialism, platform or surveillance capitalism, where digital technologies are central. Finally, growth is also a material process, where increasing use of materials and energy enables economic growth. And this is evidenced by historical correlations between these things, all of which evidence compound rather than linear increases. And that's important because compound growth is exponential and nothing in nature grows at an exponential rate infinitely. Returning to questions around sustainability, this means that the consequence of globalised capitalism's pursuit of perpetual compound GDP growth is always going to be ecologically calamitous, and we have passed that point. 
Proponents of green growth tend to defend this position on the basis that it's possible to decouple the correlations between material use, greenhouse gas emissions and GDP, and they point towards high income nations where decoupling is occurring domestically. And this really requires more nuanced analysis than I've got time for in this presentation, but I do want to note that absolute decoupling of GDP and greenhouse gas emissions is occurring in some nations, even when you account for offshoring production and international transportation. And that's because when you replace fossil fuel with renewables, absolute decoupling of greenhouse gas emissions from energy absolutely occurs. So the issue isn't whether greenhouse gas emissions can be decoupled from GDP, but whether that absolute decoupling can take place fast enough to meet international commitments to reduce climate change to under one and a half or two degrees Celsius, and here the empirical evidence so far suggests a resounding no. Rather than supplanting the use of fossil fuels, renewables currently augment their use, and historically fossil fuels followed the same additive logic. So oil and gas didn't replace earlier forms of energy, they functioned in addition to them. However, to meet global climate targets without relying on emissions reduction technologies that don't currently work at scale, we need to replace almost all the fossil fuels we use today within about 20 years. And doing this within the context of growing aggregate demand for energy makes an already extremely difficult task even harder. On the other hand, when it comes to material footprint, there's no substantive evidence for absolute decoupling. And here we should note that renewable energy still requires the extraction of large amounts of non-renewable materials. Again, proponents of green growth say that if you just look at domestic material consumption in the global core, there is some evidence of decoupling, but that totally misses the point, as the process of ecologically unequal exchange sees raw materials and energy flow from the periphery to the core. High income nations usage of raw materials exceeds domestic extraction by over 10 billion tonnes each year. So when you look at the overall material footprint of those knowledge based economies, there is no evidence for decoupling. Digital technologies are often posited as a way of transcending limitations to growth as a result of the fantasy of dematerialization that accompanies how people think about them, which is partially a result of long-standing ways that they're discursively framed as post-industrial, knowledge-based, immaterial, smart and virtual. In reality though, digital technologies are based on a wide range of dirty, polluting, resource-intensive forms of extraction and purification that produce vast amounts of often toxic waste throughout their life cycle. They're materially complex artifacts, typically containing between 60 and 70 of the 84 non-radioactive elements on Earth, which are sourced from geographically disparate locations where the extractive industries are often associated with significant local environmental harms and exploitative and harmful labour practices. When we look at the carbon footprint of an individual device designed for consuming screen media like an iPad, we find although the device itself weighs less than half a kilogram, its lifetime carbon footprint is between 75 and 85 kilograms, with the production of that device accounting for almost 80% of that total. On the other hand, devices designed for screen media production are a bit different. So for example, a high-end Mac Pro has a greenhouse gas lifetime footprint of around seven tons, and half of that is electricity being used. However, it's misleading to consider the environmental costs of digital devices in isolation because they are dependent on a vast array of networked infrastructure, from data centers and servers to fiber optic cables and wired and wireless network infrastructure to the software protocols and standards that they need to run. And so when we look at the total amount of energy used by digital networks today and the growth that's forecast for the near future, it becomes pretty obvious that any position that focuses on sustainability says that we require pretty urgent changes. And mainstream positions do periodically acknowledge this, and I want to outline three approaches we find here. The first of these is technological solutionism, which optimistically contends that market-led technological innovation will resolve all the problems we have. Some of these solutions are highly speculative, like Elon Musk's claims that material scarcity will be fixed by mining from Mars. Elsewhere, we find things that are more realistic, but which are likely to themselves be ecologically calamitous, like deep sea mining. 
And a third set of claims is exemplified by US climate envoy John Kerry's argument last year that half the reductions that we need to make to get to net carbon zero will come from technologies that we don't yet have. In terms of meaningfully responding to an emergency, the solutionist response is alarmingly reckless and woefully inadequate. A second position seeking to address some of these problems is one that focuses on increasing efficiency. And across the history of computing, there have been pretty consistent improvements in energy efficiency across the levels of components, devices and infrastructures. Increasing efficiency reduces costs, it increases profits, it's something that's inherently beneficial for producers. However, the problem with efficiency within a growth-based system is that rebound effects means that while systems become more energy efficient, the larger number of more powerful devices and infrastructure means that the overall energy and material costs still go up. And when looking at digital technologies, this is true whether we're looking at components or devices or infrastructure. And this isn't to say that improving efficiency is itself a bad thing, but that within the overall context of a growth-based system, efficiency doesn't get far enough. A third similar position which is proposed to address these issues is a transition towards a circular economy. And moving away from digital assemblages designed to be used for a short period before planned obsolescence means they fail and can't be repaired is a positive thing. And the same goes for initiatives to make digital hardware recyclable and interoperable. However, while a circular economy can reduce the volume of virgin materials needed to produce digital technologies, in a growth-based system it can't account for producing ever-increasing amounts of stuff without fundamentally violating the laws of thermodynamics. So if solutionism, efficiency and circularity can't resolve issues surrounding digital sustainability, we need alternative strategies. And one promising route involves considering what degrowth or post-growth perspectives might contribute to thinking about sustainable digital futures. These positions don't advocate for abandoning new technologies or homogenous reductions in digital technology, GDP or anything else. It advocates for altering how we evaluate things away from market-based exchange values towards underlying use values and promoting social equity and environmental sustainability rather than generating surplus value and GDP growth. Digital technologies are still distributed enormously unequally though. In high income nations like Aotearoa, smartphone ownership and internet access rates are over 95%. Um, whereas in some of the world's poorest countries, the overwhelming majority of people still don't have any form of digital connectivity. So centering social justice calls for a significant growth in access to technology, as well as things like wealth education and healthcare for those populations. But if we're talking about aggregate degrowth, but significant growth in particular sectors and places, that means we need massive reductions elsewhere. So what kind of things might we think about degrowing in terms of screen media? For me, one obvious candidate is something like 8K video, the most recent standard for spatial resolution, which follows on from 4K UHD and uses four times as many pixels as that standard. On the production and consumption side, 8K requires hardware to be upgraded, which means new cameras, new editing machines, increased volumes of data storage and higher resolution screens, both in post-production facilities as well as for end users. Streaming video has an enormous carbon footprint already, largely as a consequence of its data intensity, with estimates that between 65 and 80% of global internet traffic is already from streaming video. Most existing reports that examine those systems that are required for online streaming estimate that currently between 1.2 and 1.4% of all our global greenhouse gas emissions result from streaming video. However, those reports don't discuss the increased bandwidth and storage that's associated with the shift to 8K. YouTube streams 8K MP4 video at a bitrate of 78 megabits per second and WebM video at 22 to 50 megabits per second. And that's between 9 and 30 times the bitrate that YouTube uses for full HD 1080p streams. Recent attempts to enable users to calculate the carbon footprint of streaming media, things like Laura Marx's calculator that was published in the Media Plus Environment Journal, 
have 4K video at 3.5 to 7 gigabytes per hour as the most data intensive option. If we included YouTube's 8K bit rates, that would go up to 15 to 35 gigabytes for an hour, which is an enormous increase in the overall environmental cost of streaming. It's also worth noting that the benefits gained from increasing spatial resolution um, in many cases are almost nothing. Spatial resolution suffers from diminishing returns, so while moving from standard definition to full HD provided a really noticeable increase in sharpness, moving from HD to 4K is far less pronounced when viewing screens from more than a couple of feet away. 8K continues this trend, so for most viewers there's going to be very little you gain in terms of image quality despite the significant environmental costs, and this is precisely the kind of unnecessary and unhelpful upgrade culture that degrowth ought to target. The second example I want to flag is how degrowth might interface with digital advertising. So in 2021 the global advertising industry was worth over 600 billion US dollars, it employs sophisticated psychological, aesthetic and technological techniques to try and persuade people to consume more and faster. Within a context of socio-ecological crises that are produced through unsustainable levels of material and energy use, employing vast quantities of labour, energy and materials to try and further speed up consumption is fundamentally suicidal, particularly given that search engines enable people to easily find information they actually want, there's a really strong argument to massively curtail the volumes of advertising people in the global core are exposed to because it normalises an ecocidal level of consumption. Alongside the function of digital advertising in speeding consumption up, there's also its material cost, and in particular the cost of video advertising, which is the most energy intensive form of digital advertising. In 2016, online advertising consumed over 106 terawatt hours of energy, which resulted in over 60 megatons of greenhouse gas emissions, with video advertising thought to be responsible for over 40% of that. A 2021 EU study concluded that the carbon footprint of advertising and data trackers just on smartphones just in the EU was between 5 and 15 megatons each year and that 60% of users described those services as being unwanted or undesirable. So when we consider both the environmental impact and the fundamental function of video advertising, um, this really ought to be an area that degrowth movements campaign to enormously reduce. To wrap up then, thinking about digital technology and degrowth doesn't mean abandoning advanced technology or a homogenous reduction in the use of screen media. It does advocate for reducing the use of technologies that are ecologically harmful while producing little or nothing in terms of tangible use value like 8K video, Equally, degrowth advocates for dramatically reducing environmentally costly technologies that are designed to increase overconsumption amongst wealthy consumers like video based advertising, as well as legislating to prevent planned obsolescence and attempting to ensure that benefits from efficiency improvements and circular economies aren't wasted by rebound effects that are associated with a growth dependent capitalist economy. Thank you for listening and I look forward to hopefully talking about some of this stuff in some of the discussion sessions with you. Cheers.